Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all for this distinguished lecture series, uh, a monthly series on energy efficiency. Uh, this series, which started in the month of uh, May 2020, has been going on for the last uh, last two years. We had the privilege of uh, several industry leaders. Mr. Ravichandran Purushottaman uh, led the, the the first of the lectures, followed by Mr. Vunni Krishnan of uh, Dermax, Mr. Ranganath of Grandfors, Mr. V. Suresh, a doyen from the Indian building sector, Dr. Ajay Mathur, the Director General of uh, the Energy Research Institute at that point of time, and Mr. Tejpreet Singh Chopra. These were the first six uh, uh, experts who delivered the distinguished lecture series. They were followed up by uh, equally eminent people, Mr. Brian Madhave of uh, uh, International Energy Agency, Dr. Naushad Forbes, the past president of CII, and an unknown expert on energy. Dr. Jairam Vardaraj, Managing Director of uh, LG Equipments, Padmanabhan, an international expert on energy efficiency. Dr. Rene Van Balkal, Head of Urido India, and Mr. Raghupati uh, of CII were some of the uh, other uh, experts who delivered this lecture. The, the last uh, eight of them happened to be Dr. Ashok Sarkar of World Bank, Mr. Saurabh Kumar of uh, uh, EESL, Mr. Abhay Bakre of the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, Dr. Anshu Bharadwaj, who heads the Sakti Sustainable Energy Foundation, Mr. Chirag Baijal, the Managing Director of Carrier India, Mr. Upendra Bhatt of Sea Kinetics, Mr. A.R. Unikrishnan, Managing Director of uh, St. Gobain, and last uh, month we had the privilege of uh, Mr. Vikram Kasbekar of uh, Hero Motor Cup addressing us uh, in the Distinguished Lecture Series. All these lectures are uh, available in YouTube for, uh, for, uh, for uh, download as well as uh, uh, viewing. Today we are uh, privileged to have uh, the 21st Distinguished Lecture to be delivered by Professor Rangan Banerjee, the Director of, uh, uh, the Director of uh, IIT Delhi. Uh, to just give you a brief background of Professor Rangan Banerjee, he took over as the Director of uh, IIT Delhi recently in February 2022. Congratulations and good wishes to you, sir, for a very, very successful tenure at IIT Delhi. Thank you. Uh, Professor Rangan Banerjee has been uh, very closely associated, known for uh, his association with IIT Bombay and energy, uh, a very long uh, uh, academic education and uh, a distinguished career at, uh, at IIT Bombay. He served as the post marshal Chair Professor in the Department of Energy, Science and Engineering, a department which he helped start in 2007 at IIT Bombay. He has been involved in setting up of a megawatt scale uh, solar thermal power testing and simulation and uh, a research facility which was supported by uh, by MNRE at IIT Bombay. His areas of interest include energy management, modeling of energy systems, energy planning policy, hydrogen energy and fuel cells. A, a, a man who has been, uh, uh, if one looks for uh, uh, people from the academics in energy, the one of the first few names to come up uh, is that of uh, Professor Rangan Banerjee. His leadership and contribution has been equally outstanding. He currently serves on the editorial board of uh, International Journal of Sustainable Energy, International Journal of Sustainable Engineering, International Journal of Thermodynamics, Solar Energy Advances, uh, Global Transitions and Energy Transitions. He has been advising several city, state regulatory commissions and energy agencies, planning commission, DTIO, Gemanari and energy related uh, issues. He was earlier the Dean R&D uh, at IIT Bombay and has received the Excellence in Teaching Award from IIT Bombay. He is also an adjunct facility in the Department of Engineering and Public Policy at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. We are uh, privileged to have you, uh, Professor Rangan Banerjee, to deliver this lecture today. It is being seen by mostly, sir, uh, industry participants from all over uh, all over the country. This is also, apart from uh, the WebEx platform, this is also being relayed on uh, YouTube and, uh, and Facebook. Uh, and many of the places in, in the industry, sir, uh, uh, like we have here, uh, the CIIs, all the staff about 30, 35 sitting in one place and listening to a lecture. In many of the other places, uh, the, the, the employees assemble at one common place and the lecture is being, uh, I mean, uh, relayed on a, on, a, on a huge screen for all of them to see. Without much further ado, uh, it's my pleasure and privilege once again to welcome you, Professor Rangan Banerjee, and over to you, sir, for your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, and it's a proud privilege, and I'm delighted to be here talking to all the experts who are people in the energy efficiency space. And uh, I noticed that I'm the 21st speaker in this, and I think probably the 
first academic. <laughs> so I was just looking at the names. I think uh, energy efficiency is more about actually doing things on the ground. And I think a lot of expertise, basically, whether it is technology, whether it is systems, whether it is policies, and you have people who are thinkers, people who've had uh, things. But uh, as an academic, I would like to, so I am going to, I guess, talk to you for about half an hour. Is that correct? Uh, Half an hour is the perfect, time. Perfect, perfect. Sir. Yeah. Perfect. So you can just give me a sort of, you know, when I'm nearing the time, you can just uh, tell me so that I can uh, wind up a few minutes before. And then we can uh, take, take some time to take questions. So I'll uh, share the, it's my, I hope you can see the slides. We'll just, you just confirm once that you can see the slides. Is that visible? Yeah, we can see the slides, sir. We can see the slides. Thank you. Okay, excellent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through, uh, I'm going to give you a perspective on energy efficiency. So I'll uh, start off initially by looking at defining efficiency and then talking about a little bit of a historical perspective and then uh, give you some examples and, and talk also about, you know, how we can look at modeling when uh, we will take some examples from industry and buildings. And then towards the end, I would like to define how is this going to change in the future and what is the focus? So I'll leave you with a couple of thoughts towards the end. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about start with defining efficiency, give you some examples, give you some examples of things which our students have done and some of the research things, and then uh, try to give a perspective of what does it mean in the future? How is it going to be different? So. Uh, as we all know, energy efficiency is defined as typically the energy output divided by the energy input. And mostly we always talk about this from the first law. And the basis is the output defined based on the purpose of the device. If you're talking of a power plant, it's the electricity output. If it's a boiler, it's the heat and the steam which you're generating. And, and then, then we also know that uh, there is the second law of thermodynamics, which of course came first, but because it's so difficult to apply, people usually look at, in the second law, the, we talk about an exergy output or the available energy by the exergy input. And there are certain things which one can think of when one looks at the second law. We'll talk a little bit about that also. So just to give you, uh, this was one of the first, practical examples this is way back uh, we are talking of the steam engine and the first efficiency measurements okay and uh, this is uh, essentially this is we are talking of something like 1800s this is a paper where they and i can give you will give you the reference to it it was uh, it's there in the uh, you will see where you're looking at the uh, water which is being you know the engine and how much water is being expelled we, and we are looking at the uh, the total output which is coming out and this was was used to define an efficiency and to compare different kinds of designs um, we also had an energy service company the first concept of the energy service company was actually way back by James Watt, okay? James Watt was a very nice innovator, but he was also a very good businessman. So he started off by saying, we will leave us, this was a time when he was, you know, this was, you were competing against horses because earlier it was horsepower, which we were talking of. So he said, we will leave a steam engine free of charge to you. We will install these and take over the operation for five years, customer services. We will guarantee you that the coal for the machine costs less than you spend as fodder on the horses which do the same amount of work. And we are talking of lifting certain things, you are thinking of lifting water and everything that we require of you, you give us a third of the money which you save. And then it's very interesting and then, then he had also certain patents and then they had this Watt and Bolton. So just to show you that the energy service concept, ESCO concept is also not not really new, it started off initially as. Now, now, this is some of the things which you may want to think about and something which I'm sure all of you have, you have slogans and you said, if you talk about whether an energy unit of energy saved is equal to a unit of energy generated, or is a unit of energy saved more than an unit of, more than an unit of energy generated, or less than an unit of energy generated. 
Now, most of the energy professionals in this on this uh, platform will say that we will say that it is usually more than a unit of energy generated, and I'll explain why. And then we will. This is something that all of us have seen. Basically, whenever we talk about energy today, what we are seeing is in your rooms, which are air conditioned, or in the display that we are seeing. there is finally an illumination there is a comfort there is a final end use that we are looking at the end use activity but in order to have that end use activity we are using the energy that is available in nature that primary energy earlier used to be mainly fossil coal oil natural gas and now we are talking of solar we are talking of wind this primary energy in the form that it's available in nature is not really directly useful to us so it goes through a sequence of conversion steps so instead of coal you mine it you wash it you put it into a power plant facility you generate electricity you have the secondary energy that secondary energy goes through a transmission and distribution system you have the final energy that you buy in your cii uh, center if you're buying it from some discom you then use it within your building to run your air conditioning system or you use it for your compressed air or you use it so you get the useful energy which gives you the end use service now to get one use of one each of these conversion steps that we have some part of the energy that we are taking is used up because these are all finite these are all actual processes so there will be irreversibility there will be losses so when we need one unit of useful energy depending on the system we may need two units or three units of primary energy so naturally what we say is one unit of energy saved is usually much more than one unit of energy generated so this is one of the things that we need to keep in mind and we need to look at the entire chain and i'm sure this is something most of you have are familiar with now this is another question which i think energy professionals all have a straight answer to it we say yes of course it results in energy savings but economists have a different opinion on it so the question is does energy efficiency always result in energy savings okay and in order to look at that again just think of a thought exercise suppose you use a car and you drive 3000 kilometers annually in a car which gives you an average fuel economy of let's say 15 kilometers per liter with a particular constant price of petrol now this is i did this is now with talking of 90 or 100 rupees per liter you can find out you can say annually this is how much i'll spend if your car is made more efficient with some retrofit so the fuel economy is now 20 kilometers per liter how much would you save the simple engineering way of calculating this is we just calculate so many kilometers divided by the amount of kilometers per liter you get so many liters multiply that by the price and you get the annual uh, amount of energy that we would and uh, co- energy and cost and then we can get when we have 20 kilometers per liter we'll have relatively less <coughs> and accordingly we get this is the amount of cost saving but actually if you see and this is something you see in many of the vehicle ads you know you see that this is so efficient that you take more you start taking you drive more because you know that i have a more efficient car right so this is basically what is in a simple way this is what is called the rebound effect and in the most extreme case if the rebound is so much it might actually backfire where you use more energy than and there are of course examples of this but the answer for energy efficiency professionals is in general the rebound effect is relatively small again very little studies in the indian context and again in this case also there is a historical case so in way back in 1866 william jevons had said it is wholly a confusion of ideas to suppose that the economical use of fuel is equivalent to a diminished consumption the very contrary is the truth and he basically said that the more we start making coal efficient the more users you get for coal and so the uh, consumption of coal at the national level actually starts increasing and that's actually what happened so this is the kind of rebound and this is from you can see the paper so he talks about coal being used in the blast furnace but then you start more having more and more steel and pig iron being used so that, that that becomes more so this is the kind of thing and this is there's an interesting article in the new yorker which is called the jevons paradox and basically says that 
you know you can see that on your cell phone you see cell phones have become we have made them more efficient and then you have more and more but then you start using more things from the cell phone so the overall battery size and the energy consumption even though the thing is more efficient over a period of time you start getting more usage so this is the kind of paradox but typically globally these are the kind of rebound effects are usually small all less than 100 uh, percent is all basically 10 to 20 percent and so we do have energy efficiency and this is something where we need to have more studies on direct rebound indirect economy and we can calculate this so this was one classic example of a rebound in uk there was a chain of um, this is an old example well documented uh, a supermarket chain actually uh, provided an incentive that if you bought instead of incandescents you bought compact fluorescents you would get air miles and it turned out that the number of air miles if you did the calculations it was actually co2 you are increasing your total co2 impact but this is just to show you some of the things which are there so these are direct indirect let me just okay now the other thing which you may want to see is if you look at let's say one of the things driving our total energy sector and energy efficiency is basically this whole issue of climate change and you you know our prime minister in glasgow has made a commitment by 2070 we are going to go to net zero now if you look at a particular year and you start saying that okay as compared to 2020 we want to go to 2030 and see total amount of co2 reduction that we want to have annual reduction and then see all the options which are there and then rate them with a marginal abatement curve so the basically on the y axis what we have is the cost per ton of co2 and on the x axis is the you know the million tons of co2 that we are saving you will find typically that this is a, this is one of the mckinsey curves which was done for india and you can see that on the you will find that there are a number of things for which the cost of abatement is negative and the reason for that is they are anyway cost effective and almost all of those are energy efficiency so actually energy efficiency is makes a lot of business sense even if you don't count the carbon and of course there are reasons why these with there are um, barriers and things and the way in which you look at this so it it just makes sense in that so whenever we talk about this so let me now take you through a few examples and uh, the classical way to do this is to do an energy audit of an industry this started this terms got coined after the oil shocks in the 1970s and typically you can go through a structured way of doing an audit identify <coughs> measure look at doing mass and energy balances list out all your energy conservation opportunities prioritize them in terms of their cost benefit ratios and then we can then go ahead and uh, install the measures do a post audit and then see so typically what happens is we have many types of energy conservation opportunities and of course most of these options opportunities are more at the design stage where we can do an efficient process design we can look at efficient equipment design and selection we can design the utility system for the process and then once you have it then we can do an energy audit we can change the operating strategies we can retrofit the equipment for instance something is there where the flue gases are going out i can put a waste heat recovery device or i have let's say a variable uh, i have a pump which is operating at you are throttling it and controlling it you can put a variable speed drive these are all standard things and then if your equipment or process is inefficient we can actually replace it so that's that's the other way so when you do an audit now this is a particular this was one uh, it's an old paper but it's a, it's an actual plus audit of a cement factory in up where we have you can see when this this is a sanki or an energy balance diagram you can see in the cement that there is already some inbuilt loops where we are recovering some of the energy in different sectors in all these cases what we do often is we do benchmarking and you uh, i think with the pack which is uh, which has been um, uh, uh, which is now uh, prevalent in our country where we have actually mis- we are monitoring the specific energy consumption so typically what happens is we take the entire set of let's say cement plants or steel plants or aluminum plants and we can then see 
that what is the specific energy consumption vis-a-vis -vis and we, we arrange them from the most efficient to the uh, least efficient and then we put the top 10% and that becomes sort of a best, uh, best practice plant or that's the target and then we can see. So in the Indian context for most of the places we see that we have a lot of very efficient plants competing with plants which are actually at the tail end and, and, and so this is, this is one of the things. The other thing which has happened is we have now a standard uh, which is a voluntary international standard for monitoring and uh, looking at energy management within an industrial context. Uh, when we talk about industrial context, we are basically every industry starts with raw materials and creates products and in the process we are using the utilities and uh, we want to see that can we minimize the use of these utilities so that we, uh, we use the things internally and this is where we can use pinch and process integration and uh, so that we uh, minimize the amount of waste, minimize the amount of utility and this is a very well-defined area where there is a lot of research, there are lots of industry, uh, commercial organizations also in this space and this is something that can be. Now the question is often all of us in the energy efficiency domain often feel that we are already done, you know we benchmark each uh, ourselves with others and we say we are the best in the, let's say we are the best plant uh, in the country and maybe even the best in the world. So the question is, are we reaching our limits to energy efficiency? And to do this, this is something I was involved in, in the global energy assessment. So this was actually came out in 2012. You can see this. It's a book by the Cambridge University Press, but you can see chapter eight, it's available online. Um, it's freely available, the chapter is freely available and you will see we did this, uh, Mark Rosen of Canada did this for us and what we did is we took all the entire world's industrial process and we tried to do a first law and second law efficiency and we found that the second law efficiency of the industrial sector is just 30% while the first law is about 50% which means that many of our processes actually can be revamped so that they become much more efficient thermodynamically. Is this going to happen automatically? No, no, it won't happen automatically because all the competing industries, there are significant investments required to make that. But technically, it is very much possible to do a lot of, uh, to make these modifications. The other thing that we did, and this is again, this is one of our PhD students who had done this work. We created the process where you see, when you create a model, you talk about it theoretically. But when you look at the other end is you do an audit and you see what is happening in the industry. We couple these. We said, okay, let us look at any industry which exists and let's create a model which is for that particular set of equipments with that process. And we develop this hands-on. We, we then build up a set of models, mass and energy and flows. And uh, then we validate that model with the data. And then we use that model to see what ifs and how we can change parameters in that industrial context to actually uh, reduce the energy consumption. So we did this for the glass furnace and the glass is, a, you know, the process of making glass is actually very energy intensive industry. Uh, we looked at the air flows, we looked at the, the stoichiometry of the fuel and the uh, glass reaction, furnace geometry and then the regenerator combustion zone and then there was a loop this was a set of models and then we then validated it with a number of uh, glass furnaces and took data from these sensors temperature composition etc validated the model then we built this kind of we built a tool where which you could use they get the specific energy consumption and the sankey diagram and the different losses and then we had an ideal and an actual and we had a workshop with about uh, a set of glass industries. Each one put their own data and then we saw you can see the bars where the lower value is the model, the ideal, uh, what can be achieved with that plant and what was actually there and it shows this. So this was a scheme for model based benchmarking. We also did this for mining and uh, this was where dump trucks and ex excavators we also looked at, this is a mine transport model. We did mine water, uh, water and energy management in assessment in mines. 
again created a model. And so I think what we what I wanted to say is it is possible to look at the existing structure and the process and look at creating models and then see how we can do model based benchmarking to go beyond what exists today. And this is one step beyond the audit, but it is not going to the process modification and process modification that the design stage also you can do. The other thing that we want to see, and this is, I'll come back to this at the end, where we talk about actually in many of the industrial processes, we can reform the process to actually make it a zero carbon process. So even a process which is highly high temperature carbothermal reduction of zinc production, which is uh, can be done with solar carbothermal. So this is basically, a, there's a 300 kilowatt solar chemical plant and we created a we use this data and created an assessment by which we can look at a fully functional uh, method by doing solar and um, using a zero carbon zinc production. Again, this is currently high cost, but it is something that can be done. Uh, similar kinds of things you can look at steel, cement, and, and then these are sort of this is just to illustrate to you that we are nowhere near the bounds of where we are going. Now, let me give you some examples in buildings. And this is one of my, this is a student team, enthusiastic set of people who built a fully functional solar house, five kilowatt of PV on top, some solar thermal on top, insulation. And uh, we built this house in Versailles in France. We were the first team to compete in the Solar Decathlon Europe, we rebuilt this house on the IIT Bombay campus. And this was typically, uh, it was, uh, these are some of the images from that building and this is the way it's insulated. So typically what happened is we simulated and reduced the energy footprint of the building. And then we put PV on top to do this. We did building simulations. We also looked at the kind of views and the illumination. And you can see on this, the initial base case and then with adaptive control and ventilation with double gaze windows, overhangs, insulation and energy efficient uh, AC, we significantly reduce the kilowatt hour per meter squared per year. And then we build uh, on the top and we put PV and actually on during the day hours of the competition on the actual performance of the building, this one was we got the, we actually got the highest uh, net energy uh, supplied and that was because we had done a single axis tracking which we had optimized for that location in France. Um, so you can see this is the actual performance of uh, building input energy and the building uh, output energy. So anyway, I will this slides I will share with you. Uh, we also, another PhD student who had worked on basically where we looked at when we design a building and you simulate a building, there are a large number of parameters that we choose. And so what we thought is we can use some method from the theory of experiments to reduce that and create a simple modified model for the building so that you don't have to simulate the entire building and you can use that to create an optimization so that we can either minimize the cost or uh, improve the energy performance. And this is what we try to do with a series of um, you can see this window to wall ratio the, and the overhang depth. There were a whole host of choices for a three story building. And then we developed some correlations and then we optimized it and got the final thing. Uh, another thing which will be useful in buildings is the use of phase change materials. We had done a small exercise where we looked at first change materials with buildings and saw the impact of that on the built environment so that the air conditioning temperatures actually the requirement for AC reduce. We also have been doing mixed mode studies. So there was a PhD student who just finished where we look at ceiling fan integrated uh, air conditioning and then the set point can change and then the control can be done. Um, uh, and we also looked at predictive modeling for this. So we tried this out again in that team Shunya house. Of course, you can see that the, you know, <laughs> you have wires and other controllers which have been put over here. But basically what happens in this is we have done a real time simple simulation with hardware in the loop and where we are looking at uh, external air temperature, we're looking at the PV and we're looking at this. And so this is again something where we have comfort driven model predictive control based on this. And we saw that we can get uh, 
you, we could get significant amount of about 18% saving as compared to the normal uh, air conditioning. And again, the airflow and then this. So now, uh, just to now come back to the last few things which I wanted to talk about. Uh, the question is, does the energy efficiency metric remain relevant? And uh, what is the reason for asking for that? See, the initial energy system which we were talking of is for coal, oil, natural gas. All of these were stocks. And now what we are talking of is we have converted that into flows. So we are talking of solar energy, wind. Now that energy source itself is not too much constrained. So that is not a critical source in that sense. The scarcity of that is not much. There is a scarcity in terms of the capital cost in looking at PV modules and other things. So the cost may become a metric. The other metrics which will be important are sustainability related metrics, which are water, emissions, land and the cost, as I said, renewable energy may not, the source itself may not be constrained. We may also want to look at all the materials that we are using and look at embodied energy, embodied carbon. We may look at the entire life cycle and that should be energy payback period, not just the payback period of the cost, but also the energy payback period. And then there may be additional indices. I could indicate some of those. So just to give you some glimpses from papers, this is where, or from Allwood, this is a paper where we are looking at material efficiency. We can actually redesign our equipments and processes so that we dematerialize, we use less materials. And then the materials that we use also, we use less energy intensive materials, less carbon intensive materials, and, and then go ahead. So we are talking of uh, different product design, different kinds of materials, and, and so on. So this is, uh, Ashby had prepared a set of charts, which is very interesting. And I think you can prepare a whole set of different, when we choose materials, and you can see for a particular performance, in this case, suppose Young's modulus is the performance that you want. You can see on the x-axis is the embodied energy per meter cube and the performance which you want. And you have different kinds of polymers, metals, etc., ceramics. You can choose based on the embodied energy. You can also do the same thing based on embodied carbon. And there are many more papers. I don't want to get into details of this, but this is just to illustrate to you the strength and embodied energy. So there are, you can actually have a systematic way of decarbonizing your product or reducing the energy impact of your product. And this is again something which we may want to uh, think about. So I am going to now just, this is sort of my last slide and I'll spend a little bit of time on this and then open it up for questions. So the first thing is we, must do benchmarking and we must also look at sharing best practices. So I think in industry, we do compete, but in addition to competition, we must also collaborate because often even the segment that you are in, that we, if we look at the best practices, then you, you may actually survive in the market for a longer period. Um, and another issue, which is very clearly understood now is that often there's no level playing field for efficiency and uh, you know the savings that we get come out of some other this is very classically true for uh, many of our uh, you know like for instance the government or with let's say an iit uh, or a public sector often you have different budgets and the capital budget and this uh, the operating budget are different uh, there are also a lot of co-benefits and uh, sometimes what happens is because we do efficiency, we are able to improve the throughput. And that might make more, more of an economic case than the efficiency itself. Uh, one of the things which we have not looked at to the extent we should is dematerialization and redesign of products. And you will see in Germany and in many of these Scandinavian and European countries, this whole eco-design concept, uh, we can redesign the product. Um, as things go, as we change the nature of our energy system and we're going to have more renewable storage, timing and demand response are going to be important. So in efficiency, we also need to see when we need and what are the things. Uh, most of our energy systems are still continuing to be large scale. And even when we go, you know, for renewables, we are going into this level where we have 640 megawatts of solar PV, we are talking of 
gigawatt level plants uh, but there is also a trend where the internet of things and the sensors the costs have come down uh we can think in terms of internet of things modeling ai ml where decentralized control and looking at ways in which we can see how we can do predictive um you know predictive maintenance we can do energy efficient part load operation we can do a whole host of things and this is something which we can look at smart manufacturing and uh, this is uh, of course in iit delhi we have a center of excellence in smart manufacturing and some of these we are uh, throughputs and the things you may want to come and visit and see there are things that we could do there uh, the from best practices we need to look at next practices and the next practices we have to look at low carbon decarbonization of our industry we need to think in terms of in many of these cases when we look at process changes and technologies this needs long term r&d we need consortium approaches we need to also have some grand challenges again from between industry and academia on innovations we need to think in terms of prototypes and demonstrations now we have today the ability to create designer materials right we have nanotechnology we have bio inspired materials and this opens up again a completely new world because you know we can do materials in the way we want we can do phase change we can do storage and of course these are more longer term things but in future this is something future industrial growth can be zero carbon growth and that is something which we can use many industrial groups have been talking about this and uh, this is something which would be so uh, in, in a sense i'm saying that it's not just about efficiency now we also need to look at the environment we need to look at uh, the, uh, the we need to look at decarbonizing we need to look at reducing the environmental impact and we need to look at sustainability uh, but all the things that we've learned in the journey which we've done on efficiency can be tailor made and modified a little bit and we can go forward and this is something where there's a uh benefit to the company because it can improve our competitiveness it can improve our market share and we can also be seen to be you know socially doing the right thing and and actually making a commitment to the overall goal of zero carbon and of uh, committing to the governments and the societal need that is there so with this these are some of the references i'd like to thank some of the people of whose inputs i have used in this presentation and uh, thank you i'll be uh, i'll be happy to uh, take any try to answer any questions that people may have uh, with this i think i'm sort of at the end of my time thank you